Can I well ask you all to welcome Russell Norman and Giorgio Locatelli. Hello. Can, Good can, you, can you hear? Is this microphone working? Perfect. <clears throat> um, what a pleasure to be here, isn't it? Yeah, great. Great afternoon. Um, we, were, we were talking earlier about, um, about uh, the reason that we're here and the, uh, and the event itself. It's the, um, it's the Queen's, uh, um, Queen's Park Book Festival. And so um, I wondered whether it might be appropriate to start, um, Georgia, by talking about books, and in particular talking about your most recent book, which came out at the end of last year, I think. That's right. Would you just remind us what it is? And, um, and it's called... Well, I, I kind of like, obviously, being a chef, you always want to show all your skills and uh, all your little magic. And so the other book that I wrote, they were all about the food that I produce in the kitchen with 26 chefs and all the technological advantages than we have in every kitchen at, at the moment. And uh, then uh, obviously the editor and you know, the guys who does the books sort of kept on saying, oh, can you do another? Keep in mind that it took 14 years to write those books. Sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a really a big job. And uh, she kept on just saying, oh, can you, can you write another book? Can you just do another book? And kind of like, sort of like, look around and but I didn't I felt that you know I put so much in those two then you know there was no I didn't have so much to say anymore and um, then uh, so going on holiday with my wife and uh, usually we just the two of us and we usually rent a place and and we cook or ev I cook every day and uh, Plaxi sort of like sneakily just start to write down all these things that I cook, which are obviously very, very different than what you cook in a kitchen, you know? And they're much more based on uh, one knife, one pan, very little washing up. And uh, it's, it's like chefs don't, don't have this problem. Washing up is not our problem, it's someone else's problem, you know? But at home, it is everybody's problem, isn't it? So, so and, uh, and so she started to make this list of, of these different salads and different things than fast things than we cooked, which, you know, obviously they are, obviously, I think, I hope, and they are delicious. And um, the list got bigger and bigger. And, you know, then I went back to, the, to, to Louise Ains and I say, Bo, look, look at this list. Do you think we can write a book with this? He says, oh, yeah, of course, it's more, more, than, more than enough. And uh, so we start to actually work and really start to think about it. And so the idea was that uh, I start to think about, like, I want to cook, I want to call it sort of something like made at home, I thought, like, you know, because this is what we cook at home. We cook for the, for the people that, that we love, because there's a big difference when you're cooking for the people who pays the bill and for, when you're cooking for the people that you love. Not, it's, none of that is better, it's just different, you know? And um, so the idea was that uh, I told as well that I didn't have only one home. I have more than one home. So there is the home in London, which you know obviously includes a lot of recipes that they made for Margarita, and she was very allergic when she was young, and she's still a little bit allergic to things. So, and there is some special recipe for her. And uh, there was also the recipe that we cook for the for my family. Then I learned from my grandmother or my mother, and we cook at home in Italy, in northern Italy. Then obviously there is the home in. At the moment, is in Puglia, this house, and so which is, you know, is, is a reflection as well of what you found in the market every day. So it's different to what you cook in northern Italy because you know northern Italian food and southern Italian food is just it's two different things. And uh, and then there was the last one. There was the f actually food that we cook for the staff because you know the staff is my family as well, you know. So all these four different sort of aspect of cooking for the people that you know don't pay you for it but just say thank you or oh, no actually they don't say thank you to you <laughs> never <laughs> is is uh, it, it makes a very different food and i don't know i mean the the book come out in a very natural way yeah and uh, it really tries to come to the level of what the people cook at all yeah and which is you know it does I find out that from the idea, the idea of 
food than is in a restaurant. You have your telephone, you call up, especially in London, in central London, every Michelin restaurant, not only you call them up, but they always come in every day to try to sell you something new or something special. While at home, the, the buying becomes like a, a, a very big time. I, yeah. I know a lot of people just get ocado or things like that, but you know, to go out and buy your food takes a lot of time and to choose it. So I took in consideration that. And so the idea was just to really make sure that the people could, I mean, I hate this idea of the 20 minutes recipe or yeah. 10 minutes recipe, but you know, it has to be quick. You know, you, got, you come home from work at five, six o'clock and you know, you got that one hour and a half and then, you know, you've got to have that meal ready. And it has to be substantial. I think, I think what, you, what you've just described as well is, is actually very Italian, starting with the ingredients. Mm. Um, so um, I, I also wrote a book which has the word home in the title. And, and the, the journey to my book was, um, was going back to a city which has given me a lot of inspiration in terms of my restaurants. Uh, my first book, Polpo, was the recipes of that restaurant. But I thought um, more and more over the last five, four or five years that there was an aspect, there was an element of Venetian cooking which was missing from my experience and from my repertoire. And that was the cooking that goes on, that takes place behind the walls of the houses, behind the doors and the windows of the houses that you see as a tourist, but you never get an opportunity to go inside. And so I wanted to see whether there was a, an element uh, uh, to the cooking of this city that I've loved for a very long time, um, that you know that I could explore and that might be a little bit different to the the sort of food that I would get in restaurants. And as it turned out, it is very different. And as you say, Georgia, the you know the big difference is that the neighbours. You know, I went to a residential district in the east part of the city in Castello, where washing hangs between the buildings, and where the um, little old ladies who all wear black because they're widows go to the market every morning discuss. Um, you know what what's good with the fishmonger look at the vegetables on the veg barge and and choose you know what's what's coming that morning from the neighboring islands of Santa Erasmo mm -hmm. and it's only then at that point when they put the stuff into their basket when they take it home to their kitchens that they know what's what they're going to be cooking for dinner mm -hmm. and so there's this real sense of immediacy and this real genuine um, uh, market to table philosophy if you use the words market to table with any of my neighbors when I was living in Venice, they, you know, they wouldn't know what you meant. They don't see it as that because for them, it's just normal. It's just the way that they do things. They start with the ingredient uh, and then that dictates what, what's eaten. And I, I think you know, there's, there, there is, you, you've, you identified it yourself, there's a, there's a big difference actually um, between home cooking and restaurant cooking. Um, and I think you know, part of it is because in restaurants, precision and consistency are important because you need to make sure your customers have the same experience on a Monday lunchtime uh, in February as they do on a Friday evening in November. They, you know, they, they, can't, they can't come along and have a wildly different experience that they want when they go to Locand Locatelli. They want a Locanda Locatelli experience. But when you're cooking at home, consistency and precision aren't as important as love. Yeah, um, and also I think the, one of the things that we kind of like in the last 20 or 40 years, let's say after the war, we've been kind of like uh, attracted by this idea of abundancy, you know. And um, I find out through writing this book, and you know, I was, I was born in a restaurant and I was educated as a chef and then I worked in haute cuisine. So uh, this idea of restriction uh, wasn't restriction was never something that came into my mind. If anything, you know, was just try to use as many ingredients or technique that you could. And you know, by writing this book, I kind of realized that you know restriction was really what gives you those dishes that really last yeah. for a long time. I'll make you an example. <clears throat> when we're talking about some Italian great dishes, I don't know, spaghetti carbonara, you would think, you know, you know that is a, 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 a clear example, you know, finish the war, there's nothing, in the Italians really suffered, you know, <laughs> like with the end of the war was the five year after the end of the war in Italy were possibly the worst year. You know, there was no food, there was the black market, there was no around. There's a lot of Americans, the Americans, what did they have? They had eggs, powdered eggs, yeah. and they had bacon. <laughs> And so here you have 
a, 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 a plate of spaghetti than is cooked with some eggs and some bacon. Yeah. And so contrary to all the idea of the tomato sauce, but here you have a great restriction. You, these are the ingredients that you have there, and suddenly a dish then lasts forever. Yeah. When you know, sometimes the creativity, who remembers what Michel Gerard cook on Cuisine Minceur? Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, there is few dishes than some chefs leaves there, but most of them, they just forgotten after either the guys stop cooking or whatever. But these dishes then come from restriction. So for the fact that you can only have access to certain amount of, dish, of, of ingredients, really give a, a big mark. It leaves a, a mark. It's almost like a, a cultural expression yeah. of that. It's, you, you know, as you, were, as you were talking about the carbonara, I was thinking of other dishes, and it's absolutely, you can use lots of examples to underlie that point. So, um, for example, in Tuscany, where in the summer you have a glut of tomatoes, tomatoes everywhere, so many tomatoes that, you know, it's, it's just, people don't know what to do with them. Um, you know, some of my Tuscan friends, uh, you know, uh, they, they spend a long time collecting bottles and jars just to stuff the tomatoes into <laughs> to keep them for the winter. But the other classic Tuscan dish, of course, is panzanella. So you've got so many tomatoes, you've got loads of stale bread because you can't always eat it all from the previous day. So, And when you, when you, you, when when you, you have, have too much tomato and not yeah. enough bread, then it becomes papal pomodoro. Okay, so, so here we go. <laughs> so it's not really but if you have enough stale it's bread, like you get, it becomes panzanella. Yes, it depends the, how much you the, got. The expression that comes to mind is necessity is the mother <laughs> of invention. And it's, you know, it, it applies to food, but in particular, I think it applies to Italian food, Italian cooking. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, Italians have, you know, also when we're talking about Italian food, we always must keep in mind and it is not one thing the regions of course yeah. the region actually even they go down to uh, <laughs> province and to village i remember you know my granddad used to say then you shouldn't trust you shouldn't play with these boys called walter on number 19 because their parents put parsley in the minestrone <laughs> and that was a thing for it it's like you know it was a thing for it it was like a, it was a, and and you know and you can see that italians obviously you know the british they got the queen, they got the empire, they got these things that they're very proud of that. The poor Italian immigrants, when they went around, there yeah. was only few things that they could stand out with. Yeah. Food was one of that. Yeah. And it was incredible. Then, you know, it's still now, you go to New York and, you know, the, the, the Calabrese, they mm. really, they eat the Capocollo. And, yeah. you know, like the other guys eat another side. So it's just... Every, they Those really tiny differences between the regions, or sometimes exactly. like between one village and the next. Yeah. Um, we there was a big controversy in the UK last year, I think, when one of our national treasures, Mary Berry, uh, published a recipe for carbonara, I think, in which uh, I think she put she put cream. cream. <laughs> <laughs> and it, honestly, Italy just went ballistic. <laughs> uh, you know, even Italians who have never heard of Mary Berry or didn't know what it was. What is a Mary Berry? Uh, uh, they they got in. They got in on on the conversation because Absolutely. it was so appalling yeah. to Italy as a nation that anybody would do this. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it, you see, it's just a sense of belonging. It's yeah. just it's just they feel that you know we we are from here. We eat these things, yeah. and you know, and they find it very different. It's the same thing with wine. Mm. You know, while you are in a restaurant in London, and you know, in Locanda, we have seven hundred different wine from, you know, every region of Italy. Yeah. You know, if you go into a Mission Star restaurant in Italy, it will only have the regional wine. Yeah. So it's a very very important thing. It's almost like you know the food is what makes them be and. In reality, he is because you know the food makes us what we are. Yeah. But to get back to what we say, which is like the idea is just we should go to you should when you go to shop in a supermarket. I think you should not go all through the supermarket. You should go only through one island at a time. And yeah. I think your cookie will be better. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like do not too much is not good with food. It's yeah. just I'd like I'd like to come back and talk about um, you as uh, an Italian in the UK because yeah. we've been here for a very long time and 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 I could talk a little bit about my very short experience of being an Englishman in in Venice uh, for fourteen months. But can I start, Georgia, by asking you talked um, just a moment ago about a sense of belonging. Yeah. Um, when did when did you first come to the U? And you also said earlier. I don't know if any of you noticed, but it sounded to me like you said you were born in a restaurant. Did Did you hear that? Yeah. Wait, second, were you, were you, second floor. You really were born in a restaurant. Yeah. I didn't know this. On the second floor. Literally born in a, yeah, in a hotel restaurant. In a hotel yeah. restaurant. That's obviously <clears throat> uh, back home in Italy. In Varese. When did you first come to the UK? I came here when I was 
2020. 20. Because I finished the, uh, you know, it was compulsory military service right. till 18 to 19. Yeah. And then as soon as I finished there, I went to Switzerland for one year. Yeah. And uh, which, you know, Northern Italian tend to go to Switzerland yeah. to work. There's a lot of uh, immigrants of go there and you just get a visa for a, a year or something like that yeah. very easily. And then uh, and, and I was working at the Dolder in, in Zurich. And, you know, but I always had this idea that I, I wanted because when I was tiny, I was, you know, we had a, the restaurant was very simple and... Uh, it's kind of like in a, on the shore of this little lake called Lago di Comabio, which is near to Lago Maggiore. And uh, we had two rooms. We had 10 bedrooms, and we had two rooms. And uh, the two rooms, one was for just for banqueting and one was for the restaurant. The banqueting was really, really busy, especially, you know, during the, the season, you know. Yeah. Even three, four celebrations a week. And uh, so the whole family would come together, and, you know. And uh, we used to have chefs as well that worked for us there. And one day, when I was about like six or seven, these chefs arrived. And this was the first chef to arrive in the kitchen. He had books. Yeah. And one of the books was the Repertoire de la Cuisine from Auguste Lescoffier. Yeah. And he wrote it, the Savoy. And so for me, that was my first sort of, you know, he had all the pictures and yeah. all this beautiful sculpture and things like that. So that, answers, that I, answers my next question. Why did you choose London? It was because it was of the, the Savoy. Savoy. The Savoy, yeah, the Savoy yeah. was, was... Then I realized then as well, the Savoy was a very important port because yeah. it was always run by Italians, especially the front of the house. While the kitchen was very French, the front of the house would be, you know, run yeah. by Italians all the time. In fact, when I was there, I was the only Italian in the kitchen and, you know, against 220 whatever yeah. waiter in, in, in the world. So this would have been the, the early 80s, something like 84, that? 84, 85. 84. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was Anton Edelman was the chef. Wow. And uh, it was a, a great experience. And then I realized, I realized, then I realized, I look back at <laughs> the you know, when they do you this sort of like, you know, they show you around the place and they show you all the different departments. I realized how my family worked. My family was an hotel department. Yeah. You know, my, my granddad with my auntie was in charge of reception. My two grandmother were in charge of the laundry. My uncle was in charge of the food and the general sort of buying and, and bringing in the stuff. And everybody helped, whatever. And my first job there was to make, like, uh, I was allowed in the kitchen because I was too small, you know, I was yeah. too tiny. And my first job in the kitchen was actually to do the Macedonia, which is, you know, the fruit salad. Yeah. And, you know, there's like 220 people fruit salad. So there's this <laughs> bucket of fruit salad and like three box. I still, I still be able to peel it. I can, I can beat anybody to peel an apple. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can be as fast as me to peel an apple. <laughs> and then, you know, and then the idea was to come to London and... London for me was, uh, an inc I mean, can you imagine? I come from a village with 1,600 people. Yeah. So it was like, I remember the first time I went back after nine months, the, all my friends said, oh, it's London. I said, oh, London is brilliant. You know, there's these neighbors, and I don't know who they are. Yeah. And, you know, I come from a village, then if your granddad has made a mistake, that you still carry that <laughs> nickname. You know what I mean? If there was something wrong with it, you still carry it for the rest of your life. <laughs> and uh, so it was a, a, a great release, you know? Yeah. And... There was this idea that, because you must remember that it, it is now, Italians are very proud to be Italian. Now we have Prada, we have Armani, we have uh, Ferrari, we have all these things that make us really proud to be Italians. But uh, that is only from the 70s yeah. onwards. Yeah. Before that, all the Italian that you met, they always try to integrate and they always try to not be in Italian to the point that some of that changed their name to sort of Inglesize their name. Really? Okay. Yes. I was talking today to the lady just in the square where we live. Yeah. And she's been here from 1946. Yeah. And she said, yeah, you know, it's not, it wasn't as easy to be Italian when, when I arrived here. Yeah. This is just a different thing. But the Savoy was just such a, an international place, and I felt straight. And London as well was a place that made me feel really well. So, so that was, I mean, was in almost thirty years ago then. So you, you've been you've been in the UK longer than you've lived in Italy. That's yeah. what Plaxi says all the time. <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> so my question then um, is, what changes have you seen in terms of? You know, I, I would imagine that most of the audience here uh, is British. You know, we're fascinated by how we're seen uh, across the world, and we're also fascinated by the reputation we've had for a very, very long time of of being, you know, one of the worst food nations. 
Um, our cuisine has been a laughing stock for the best part of a century, I think, maybe a bit more. What changes have you seen in food culture in the UK since you first arrived here uh, to the present day? Enormous, enormous, enormous. I mean, there was this great devotion to French cuisine, which yeah. I, me too I had sort of thing. You know, I come here because I wanted to cook haute cuisine. And yeah. after the Savoy, I went to Paris because I thought that right. that is the place that you have to be if you want to be a chef. While now, you know, you can be a fantastic chef and just cook Italian food. It doesn't yeah. really matter. You don't need to be sort of educated in that sort of cuisine, haute cuisine, as yeah. they used to call it. And... The idea was just the, the formula was different, you know. It seems to be, when I arrived here, it seems that you could only have good food if you were in a smart place. Yeah. And that was something that was completely against everything that I learned when I was little. Because, you know, our place was very humble, but the food was delicious. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and in Italy, most of the time, when you go, <clears throat> there is people that say, oh, in an Italian restaurant, if you go in, if there is more than a fork and a knife and a glass, on the table, if there is two, four, two, there is more stuff. Don't go into that yeah. restaurant. <laughs> nah, it's not just you have to go to the place that they very. That's stay. a really good rule of thumb, actually. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. And and so it's, it, I, I, what I noticed is just because obviously I mean I had these three years on these thirty years I had these three years and I was in Paris. Yeah. And then I decided to come back, which is very fortuitous as well. I come back, but when I when I come back, the River Cafe was already open. Right. And suddenly you could feel yeah. this really attention to the ingredients and the people start to really wonder what... And I guess the traveling has been made so easy. So, you know, if you go to Italy and you have a fantastic dish, or if you go to France and you have a fantastic dish, when you come back, you're not going to eat a, a, one of these bad cannelloni or bad lasagna. Yeah. You, won't, yeah. you will expect a very good one if you had a good one before. Because one of the things that we do seems to remember very well is when we eat something good yeah. that is fixed in our mind, yeah. you know? And, you know, and we attach it to a memory that is yeah. incredible. So, and I, I feel that the British have come long, long way the TV has helped a lot. I'm yeah. sure the TV has helped a lot. And as well, the books, you know. I mean, I think that it is the nation that consume more. In Europe, is England is the nation that consume more cookbooks. Oh, I can believe that. Than anybody else. I, I'm, so I'm pretty sure everyone in this tent would agree with that. As well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing, yeah. We're, we're all hopeless addicts, aren't we? There's sort of more books than we will ever use in our lifetimes, but we can't stop. Um, but also the attitude, you understand, it's just the attitude towards food. Because yeah. coming from a nation that has a sort of, I'm not saying plain, but a very open palate. And, you know, like, in, in, you, know, like you would find it difficult to get Italian people to eat a curry. Yeah. You know, yeah. very, very difficult. You know, like a one in ten would like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And here, the palate was very open and ready to accept all these different influences. And that's what our play our, us in London is successful more than Paris. Because, you know, if you go to Paris, yes, if you want to eat a, a, a three mission star dinner, that's fantastic. You get the best one in the world. I'm sure it's still like that. But if you want to have a good Chinese meal or a good Indian meal or a good Chinese yeah. or Japanese, there's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. You know, they just they just completely just go one way. That's what they eat. And like here in London, it's flourished completely. And we have the best of every cuisine really represented in London. And is, it is, because, is it because, it's really interesting what you just said about Italians and, um, you know, the, the, the lack of adventure, I suppose, in you know, trying these other international cuisines. Is it because Italian regional cooking has always been so fantastic that they've never wanted to veer from it and is in the uk by contrast is it the case that because we've never really had a great national cuisine that we've appropriated these others uh, as part of our um, identity as well because i think i mean you talk about curries i mean cu also, curries I, I, curries are as english as <laughs> as, 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 as as yorkshire pudding i think it's, i think it's got to do also with sort of like rock and roll and punk and all that. Yeah. And the youth were so taken by that and eating was seen for so many years as yeah. something that was just like the culture was expressing something else. They yeah. didn't feel that the, you, you, you represent your culture when you actually are eating something. Yeah. And, and these has come through now. I mean, I think, this, I mean, I guess it's Jamie Oliver sort of teach everybody. He's, he was very, like, you know, he's popularized. I mean, he came, he came from the River Cafe, of course, yeah. and, and took but what they... 
it cannot teach the young people that, you know, if yeah. you have one girl that you really, really like, if you take her home and you cook her a meal, <laughs> maybe you got yeah. 20% more, 50% more chance yeah, yeah. get off with yeah. her than if you take her to the pub and get drunk with your friends and one of them walks out with her or something like that. Is you that what Jay Gollum kinda, says as well? I, I think he yeah. kind of like just got into that. Um, before we get off the subject of, um, of Italy, UK, UK, Italy, um, I, I grew up in the 70s in West London, in Hounslow. And um, my mother was very adventurous and, you know, would try different things. And I always remember the first time we had spaghetti bolognese, which mm. we Brits still insist on calling it. It doesn't exist in Italy. Mm. It's a dish from Bologna, which is always made with tagliatelle, uh, nearly always made with uh, pork and beef. Uh, very, uh, you know, very sort of low on tomatoes. Isn't that soupy dish that we're familiar with? Well, no tomato at all. Or, no, or no tomato at all, just a sofrito. And so a very different dish in uh, in Bologna. But um, we, we sort of have this version of it. My mother was the was the worst culprit for this version of spaghetti bolognese, which into which she put mushrooms. <laughs> Uh, and um, but I always remember the first time that we got the um, the tub of Parmesan cheese, which you couldn't buy fresh Parmesan in the shops. You just got this tub in the chiller cabinet, uh, a cardboard tub with a plastic top. Is this familiar to anybody? Can you still get it even? And it it smelled like sick. Uh, it it was it was true. Do you know what I'm talking about, Giorgio? Now this, <laughs> this for a very long time was how we, certainly how I, in a you know in a in a working class family, grew up thinking, th thinking that this was Italian food. Mm. Have you had to struggle against a, a, an, an opinion or a vision or a version of Italian cooking that um, that we British have? No, there is sometimes in the restaurant some people come and they say, "Oh, how can it be an Italian restaurant if you don't have pizza?" Really, and you go like you know, well, this is a northern Italian restaurant. We don't have pizza. I never yeah. eat pizza. I ate pizza the first time when I was about six or seven. Yeah, because there wasn't like you know. And I remember as well eating pasta only once or twice a week. I remember inviting my friends to say, "Oh, my my grandmother's cooking spaghetti with tomato." So come and have yeah. spaghetti with tomato on Tuesday. That was it. The Tuesday was the day that we had spaghetti with tomato. Yeah, and it was like you know, but. Italian, even Italian food until very recently hasn't re wasn't really mixed up as it is. And mm. as we say, you know, you always belong to that. But the idea is that, you know, I feel that you should not, when somebody's trying something or is putting something of himself into a recipe, I find it very difficult to say, oh, that's an abomination. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a little bit like if you have, you are, if you are at home and you're cooking something and you got inspired by the ingredients that you saw, I think that you're doing well. Yeah. You know? And anybody who says they need abomination, that's forget about him. What do you do? So okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna push that point <laughs> on you. What do you do then if somebody comes to uh, Locanda, uh, Locatelli uh, and asks for Parmesan on their linguini vongoli? Oh, well, you know I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Well whatever was this like in when we had the first restaurant that we had was called Zafferano, no? Yes. And I used to do this, this, this you know, they, they used to, the waiter come down and will say, oh man, this guy is, wants lasagna, or yeah. he wants a pizza. And, yeah. And I used to go up and just, I was a bit younger, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go out and take the tablecloth and walk away with the tablecloth. Re oh wow. I did it like a few times until, so Plaxi tell me, no, this is not possible, I'd, you can't I'd, do that. I'd pay That's to not. see that, I, I really would. <laughs> I. I think then, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, times goes by and, yeah. you know, you just become a little bit more calm. And, you know, and at the end of the day, I still feel that if somebody is asking for cheese on a, yeah. a vongole, I do not agree. Yeah. And, you know, and I spend a lot of time choosing the vongole. We spend a lot of time choosing the, the right olive oil. They're going to go with that. Yeah. And all that work is going to be blown away. But he's sitting down. You don't want to ruin the evening for everybody else. Yeah. Then sits around him and uh, just, so just just tell the way to put it on the just, table and run away. Yeah, and just yeah. put it down. Yeah. Just let him do it. You don't yeah. do it. <laughs> I have a friend uh, Luca uh, in Venice who runs a restaurant called Ale Testieri, yeah. and he says that occasionally people will ask for parmesan with uh, seafood dishes, mm. and he patiently goes to the table and says something along the lines of. Perhaps you'd like to try 
this dish in the more traditional way that it was intended, uh, which is without the parmesan. Um, it really does taste a lot better. Can I suggest that you try it this way? And then, you know, if you if you want, you know, some parmesan, maybe we can sort of uh, talk about it later. But just try it, try it, try it my way first. And he really patiently tries to explain to them. And most of the time, he wins. Most of the time, they say thank you very much. I I, I do like it, and I don't need any cheese on my fish. I remember. The father of Plaxi one time, one time told me this, like, you know, he says, uh, whenever, because I used to go mad, because there is people, and they usually are very much the same type of guys, and they come, and before, then they actually, the, the food comes, and they take the salt uh, and the pepper, yeah. before they actually even taste it. Yeah. You know? And my granddad, the granddad used to say, Clive used to say, those guys have been too eaten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Are it, these are Etonians. It's so a sort of reflex right. for Never some people. Never trust them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he used to say, yeah. "Never trust those guys. They're from Eton. When they put salt before that, they taste." Yeah. It. And obviously, it comes from from years of eating bland food, or, yeah. or and you know, it's or natural. unseasoned food. But you know, from clumsy yeah. cooks who don't who don't put seasoning well, yeah, in. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously, I feel that every chef seasoning is one of the things that you found then every chef has a real touch. Yeah. And, you know, um, and that, I learned that in Paris was, was really, really incredible, you know, to the point that it will take us, so we will have a recipe and we will have little caps with measure mm. one, two or three grams yeah. of salt. And then we will have to use it to the recipe. Yeah. It would not allow us to season a pinch. Like no, that. no, no, no. It was, that, it was precise, uh, yes. prescriptive. It was yeah. like, you know, it was uh, incredible. It was so... And, and because he says, because the chef used to, say, when I say to him, this is ridiculous. He wastes like 20 minutes every morning to make all these little caps, you know, with this one gram of yeah. salt in it. And, and he says, yeah, yeah, but this is my food. Yeah. And that's what he says. It's my seasoning is my food. Mm. And that's a, a, a very good thing, you know, because it's true. You know, sometimes you go to a place because the seasoning is perfect. Yeah. And, you know, it really makes a difference on that. Giorgio, you mentioned your daughter, Margarita, earlier. Mm. Um, Dita, I think, Dita. is is, is your, um, is your family name for her. Um, I don't know if if um, if members of the audience know this, but um, but Giorgio and Plaxi's daughter, Dita, has a number of quite dangerous food allergies. Well, she's anaphylactic to yeah. food. So to how many? I mean, it's... It was it's about a, 600 at the start, when we started counting them, because that was it. And then we just stopped. Stop. So stop as as, the as, a, one that she as a as a chef who has uh, you know an astonishing uh, international <laughs> reputation uh, and as as a man whose life is about food, how I mean when when did it happen? Firstly, when did you find this out, and how has it how has it affected you as a food family? <clears throat> well, it started very early because you know she started to have as soon as she got into solid, her yeah. skin really flared up, and then she had a septicemia, and then she was in the hospital for a month. And so there was, a, and then when we sort of managed to make her a bit better, and we took her to to eat to France. Actually, we went to southern yeah. France for some holiday in the house of a friends of us. And Jack, our son, gave her a little bit of salmon, and that was it. You know, her head swallow up like that. And uh, it was by chance that we sort of like we didn't even know where the hospital was, and so we drive out, and we meet this uh, pompier, the fire, fire brigade. engine, yeah. And uh, and this and this is exactly the same thing that they use. They use a, a shot of of. Um, it's adrenaline, I think. Adrenaline, is it? Yeah. yes. EpiPen. Yeah. yeah. It, because if you haven't breed for a long time, so that's what they do. They have these with them, and they just as soon as they get you, they shot you some adrenaline, so <gasps> you start to breathe again, you know. And so she, he realized that that what he was, yeah. and give her the adrenaline and, and saved her life really because yeah. that time was you know if we wouldn't never take her to the hospital in time. <clears throat> And then from them, I felt really, oh my God, how can it be possible to, <laughs> for, to me? Why? Yeah. So my life is all about food. And here I have somebody, then I have to, we had to, I mean, we couldn't cook with that, no nuts in our house. Yes. We never cooked fish. Yeah. Uh, these were the main things, you know, but like all the food in the house was suited for what she could have. Yeah. And, you know, this sort of like for, for few years it was I was really upset about it and and then suddenly I realized no actually this is the best she is lucky enough then at least she has 25 chefs in the kitchen then can actually take care yeah. and try to make it so we yeah. kind of end up making like tomato ketchup with beetroot and banana or yeah. things like that 
but well, it's like you, what you were saying earlier <laughs> about restrictions, yeah. you know, necessity. Well, of, uh, well, one of the best things was just like she would just she would, <laughs> she was so sweet about it because she couldn't eat things, but she loved the food because she see that we love food, you know, and all our life was about food, and so she would have these things that she would go like she. When you eat something, she's like, can I smell your breath? And she'll come and smell, <laughs> and smell what you eat. And then she yeah. has, I'm sure she has a pattern in her head yeah. than what some food that she can have had. And uh, only like uh, about four or five years ago, we ran some other test and suddenly Plasi come back and says, she's not allergic to tomato. So wow. for me to manage to yeah. make her eat <laughs> for the first time like a pizza, and the spaghetti with tomato yeah. was just the greatest sort of satisfaction. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just a, such a touching thing. Fantastic. Oh, tomato ketchup as well. She yeah. eats as well now. Sort of thing. Um, how many of us uh, here in the audience have enjoyed um, G Giorgio and Andrew um, on the telly? Um, mm. Roaming Italy and uh, looking at uh, the historical... Yeah. Uh, architecture and museums and art and uh, and cooking food. Um, the reason I mention this, Georgie, is because you spent a very long time saying no mm. to <laughs> to television producers. I know this about you. No, 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 this isn't me. No, no, I'm a you know I'm a chef and I'm interested in food. And I think you turned down everybody that came to you. But recently, you've started to say yes a bit more. Uh, why, why, why is that? So I'm 55. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I spent like 35 years in the dungeon. <laughs> and uh, no, it was, I think this idea with Andrew was incredible. And it was such an open... We're talking about Andrew Graham Dixon. Do, do, we, yeah. do we, we know? Okay. It was a, such an incredible experience to travel with him. Because, I mean, Andrew is somebody that loves Italy more than the Italians. That's for mm. sure and knows, in certain cases, knows more than most yeah. of the Italians about the heart of it. So it was, an in, it, it was also something like, so I come to Asia, I felt that I, was, I wanted to represent my, I wanted to make sure that the people understood the food for this idea of locality and where it come from and the tradition and the history and the art and everything was very much one thing. It's not, you know, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not, there is no, there's no distance between the things. The, 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 they all work together. Yeah. It's our culture. And I felt that, you know, it was incredible that they want me to do this. Too. To the point in like, I mean, I was driving this scooter <laughs> with Andrew on the back. And we, it was like 5.30 in the morning. And we were just going. They wanted to have a shot of us going around the Colosseum in Rome. And I, just, I was just driving. And I was thinking, like, I cannot believe I'm getting paid to do this. You know, it's yeah. like, this is the best thing. I mean, like, this is that like, you cannot yeah. get a better job than this. You yeah. know, and it was an incredible. I learned so much from him. I guess he learned from me as well. But uh, it was getting on. It was very, very much really try to show this bit of Italy. Then yeah. sometimes it's really it's a bit hidden because a lot of the people tend to go to Italy and you got. In fact, you know, it was called Unpack for the idea. The, the program was called Italy Unpack because we thought that we would not go into any center than the tourist goes. Right. Because a lot of people just end up going on this one week in Italy and they go one day in Rome, one day in It's like a mini Venice. grand tour. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and you end up with two million Japanese and Chinese mm. and Russians and Americans walking down the same street, queuing up for the Uffizi, for the Uffizi yeah. or things like that. And this really takes away a little bit. Yeah. The idea to really show the people that, you know, Italy is a quite civilized country. You can, can drive a car. It's a bit more dangerous than in England, but you can drive a car. And the best thing is to actually go there and do not go into Venice. Do not go yeah. into Rome if you really want to have a taste of it. Yeah. Stay in the provinces. And this... And, even in the provinces, you get a great value in art, yeah. culture, and especially in food. And that was really you, you also present um, a, a cookery competition show. That was a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> T tell, us, tell us briefly why that, was, uh, why that was a nightmare. Well, while you're thinking why it was a nightmare, let me, let me, let me give you um, a, a little um, uh, example of my experience of of the damage I think that these cookery shows can sometimes do. I, I have a few restaurants and from time to time I'll, um, I'll be called in to interview a senior chef for a senior chef position. Um, and quite often that will um, uh, take the form of an interview and um, a little cook-off where we'll try a few dishes from a, a particular chef. Um, and very often I find that young chefs 
uh, are trying to impress with dishes that contain six, seven, eight ingredients and uh, you know four or five different techniques and they've got some foam and they've got a few smears on the plate and they've got some you know scaffolding so that the ingredients are up sort of in a tower and I look at these I look at these plates and my heart sinks and I say to these young chefs can you can you go back to the kitchen can you take at least three of those ingredients away and prepare something a lot more simple. And it's my personal opinion that programs like MasterChef, as entertaining as they are, mm. have given the general public and some of our industry as well a false idea of what good food is. And so you've, you've got this very strange uh, expectation now that in order to be a good chef, you have to be able to do all of these ridiculously complicated things uh, and just throw everything onto a single plate of food. But I, it's a I, long question, but... Um, no, <laughs> but I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, sometimes it's... Obviously, TV needs to be dramatized. Yeah. And, you know, cooking at home it doesn't need to be dramatized at all. Actually, more quiet and more natural and more calm you are when you cook at home is <laughs> usually is the best is the result. Yeah. But uh, the idea is that, you know, I, I feel that food on TV has done a very good... Has, has done very well, especially for... Britain, yeah. much, uh, has elevated the standard, everybody. Everybody starts to look at things like that. Obviously, you know, there's always this idea that it's always new, always new, yeah. need, need something new, need something. When, you know, it's not fashion. Food is not fashion. We don't, you know, it's something that we have to eat. And, you know, the ingredients are there, the palate is there, and you can mix it. And then every now and again, you have a genius that yeah. can make us something incredible with a carrot or with a tomato. But <laughs> every now and again, you know, it's like yeah. <laughs> one chef out of thousands, yeah. you know. And this idea that uh, food is becomes sort of an entertainment instead of be a cult of a cultural value that yeah. that's what the mistakes land yeah and so i don't know i like m much more to do to work on tv when i'm allowed to do documentaries yeah. sort of like like italian pack that's, that's so much more enjoyable because i feel them the real truth will come out yeah and again the food of the necessity the food well the because they're programs the of discovery rather than uh, yeah. uh, of manufacture it's yeah. rather than a, a yes. sort of format that's constructed and you know you have to think as well then like technologically we have made massive step forwards in the last 10 years yeah i mean like the type of equipment that we have in the kitchen now compared to what we had you know, 10 or 20 years ago, even at the Savoy, where, you know, it was a, an incredible new, fantastic kitchen, just built and everything. But it was fire yeah. and steam and, <laughs> and fryer, and that was it. You know, that, that was the three things that you had to deal with. Now we work in a very different way. We control the temperature, we sous vide, we slow cook, yeah. it's much more. But those things can be, all this technology can be used to a great advantage for home cooking. In the book, we talk about it using those, those slow cooker that you can just buy. Those are fantastic because you can just get up in the morning, you put all your ingredients in, you topped it up, you plug it in. Yeah. By the time you come back in the evening after eight hours, you have the best stew in the world because you cooked it at 90 degrees instead of 100. You know, the collagen is, of the meat is melt perfectly in it and gives you that really sticky sort of sensation yeah. and the flavors really comes together. So it's really try to use the technology to the, to, to, in the right way. Going back to telly, though, mm. you, what, why, <laughs> why, was it, why was it a nightmare? Yeah, because, like, with Andrew, if yeah. we get up and we had a, yeah. a bit of a fallout or, or, or things, you can actually see it, you know? Right. We, we really are, or we are just going along doing that. Yeah. And there's bad day and good day, and there's things that you like and things that you don't like. You let that sort of emotion coming through. Yeah. In, in that kind of program, there's, you have to be the same guys all yeah. the time until they tell you, oh, now you have to be nasty, or now you have to yeah, be yeah. good. Or, yeah. And so that's a, a little bit, I, I, yeah. could, uh, I couldn't really, really, I didn't enjoy that much. Fair enough. I, um, I, I think I lost a couple of kilos doing that. Well, every time I go to, <laughs> every time I go to Italy, I come back with like a couple of kilos more. Filming in Italy. It's like and sort of yo-yo. <laughs> filming that thing. Filming, I, I filming in the UK, filming Europe. in Italy. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to open up for questions in a moment, but I've got just one, one last um, question uh, for you, Giorgio. Um, I think I know the answer, but um, you've just been talking about sous vide and you've been talking about technology and you know, how it can help and, and you know, how it's, it's, it's a part of professional cooking now, whether we like it or not. But if you were given just one dish that you, um, that you could cook or eat, for the rest of time, 
Um, I know it's a very obvious question for a chef, but I, but I, I you know, I, I know, I'm not going to preempt your answer, but w w what would your dish be? Uh, risotto. Yeah, I thought yeah, you might yeah, say that. That's, uh, that's what, what is it? I mean, I agree. There is something about making a risotto on my own at the stove, which is which is just like meditation. Yeah. You know, I can. I'm sure that my blood pressure um, uh, becomes lower and my pulse um, lowers. You know, everything about me just changes mm. because. There is this sort of meditative, therapeutic uh, quality to making risotto. But what, what is it for you that? I think it's. I think it's got to do with the fact that I, each one of us must have have definitely a memory that is attached to something that they eat. Yeah. And uh, and you know the moment that you eat that dish, suddenly you are in transporting to that situation, and more that dish is the same of the one that you had that time, and more you feel like that little kid, yeah. than, and you know, coming home from school, and keep in mind, we used to have risotto at lunch four times a week, maybe yeah. five. So coming home from school and, and be there, and you know, and my grandmother used to see the bus coming across before it comes, and she will just put the risotto on. So by the time you're at home, you wash your hand, the risotto will be ready. And that was something that, you know, for me, it's just every time I have a risotto, a good one especially, then you know I feel like I'm, I'm like that little kid. And, and what, you know. what would you what would you put into your desert island risotto? Well, my favorite risotto is white truffle risotto. Right. That's okay. that, that's my favorite. But any risotto I can eat, yeah. anything you know. Yeah. And uh, so in Puglia as well, when we are there, like they don't rice, they do they do a, a very fantastic dish, and it's. Uh, Rice, which is, you know, for a northern Italian, it's like a, you, you think that it'll kill you. It's just like rice, potato, and mussel. And wow. so, and they steam the mussel, and then they leave them at the bottom of the, of the pot. And they take away half of the shell. Yeah. So, and they leave, so the shell stays up like that. And then they sprinkle the, ris the rice on top, yeah. which is risotto rice all the time. So no basmati or anything like that. Like, you know, either a carnaroli or a violone nano, some or arborio, yeah, yeah. and they sprinkle it on top, and then they put a layer of potato, and then they take some salted water and they put it on top. Wow! And so the juices of the of the of the mussel mix with the salted water, and and the, obviously the potato on top becomes completely, you know, crackly and beautiful yeah. brown. And the rice swallow up to the. You never stir it or anything yeah. like that. And then when you eat it, you can you kind of you don't even use the the knife. Or, sorry, the spoon or anything like that. Because you pick up the shells as you're going along, and you eat it through the shell like that. And it's a. What's it called? I've not come across it's this. It's called tiella. Tiella. And it's very strange because I'm yeah. just trying to understand where is it coming yeah. from. These things. But who's hungry now? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's incredible. It's like. I think I, I kind of like, especially from when we start to cook in Zafferano, yeah. we bought every possible book from every possible Italian chef from every possible region. Also, I employ a lot of Italians that come from different regions. So every time, as one of the guys comes, we always like focus on him and says, oh, where did you work? What did you do? What did you cook in that place? So we always try to get all these different influence. And, uh, and I think I knew... I know a bit about Italian food, but in Puglia, yeah. it's just that I feel like I'm a little, I don't know, nothing. You know, as I, I went well, how great to, to, you know, to, to have somewhere, to find somewhere that, uh, that you've got a voyage of discovery ahead of you. This, this, the guys who help us look after the house, yeah. it's called Lillino, he says, oh, I'll take you to buy some vegetables from the people who grows them. So we got on this scooter and we go, we're driving through this, we, we are on, right on the sea, but he drive me right in, you know, in five yeah. minutes you are deep in the countryside. <laughs> and we go there and there's this little hut and there's this woman like crouching down like that in the ground. And he start to ring his little me, 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 right, as he's coming across. So she gets out, she comes into the what is the shop sort yeah. of thing. And uh, the woman just has these boxes. I mean there was five things. There was some tomato, there was some onions, there was some garlic, and then there was these things, then they were in a courgette. And they were in the cucumbers, and they were short and fat. And I say, I've never seen this. Mm. What are they? Ah, these are cucumarats. Cucumarats. Wow. And uh, I yeah. never heard about no. it. 
So for, a, for somebody who's been cooking for yeah. 35 years to see a vegetable Italian yeah, you've yeah. never seen yeah. about it, it's like it's amazing. It is like you know, you know, <clears throat> wow. And I, not only she proceed to tell me how to cook them. Yeah. And they and, and but and this is what Lilino I love about Italians. Knows, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Lilino the nose that I'm a chef was looking at goes like, well, you telling him how to cook this <laughs> thing? Yeah? And you know, we come home and I follow to the yeah. And this salad that we made was unbelievable yeah. to this recipe. And again, this idea of like, because they're so close to the sea and salt, you know, salt. Yeah. Or is, you know, in Italy, you have this shop, which has got a big tea, sell, now only sell tabac. But if you look yeah. well underneath, it says sali e tabacchi, because salt and tobacco yeah. were taxed by the Pope, and, and from the, po the Pope start this idea to, to, to make a, a tax on the soul. So you could not, even if you, have, even if you live near the sea and you have salt on the rocks, you cannot pick it up, you cannot do it. You have to go and buy because you have to pay the right. tax for them. Yeah. And so this idea, then, like the Pugliesi, they don't use in a lot of the old recipe, like the, the Stiella or the Cucumarats, they don't use salt, they use seawater. Mm. So, and then they will mix enough fresh water to the seawater, and then they'll add it. So even the salad, when you go to, if you ever go to Puglia one day, you'll see that the salad, they go like a lot of like, like it's a bit of vinegar, and then they don't season it, they just get some salted water on it, even yeah. a tomato salad. And that makes a great difference, because the old dish suddenly changes, yeah. you know, the approach in the mouth. And this is something that I learned, you know, yeah. like, Last year. <laughs> Fantastic. When I was in Venice for, for 14 months writing my book, um, I spent the first couple of months, you know, trying desperately to find out what my neighbors were cooking, you know, uh, sort of going up to them at the market uh, stall and, and very timidly asking what they were going to be making with these particular ingredients. Sometimes they would tell me, sometimes they'd sort of run away thinking, who's this strange Englishman in our midst? It was a very residential part of Venice. But after a couple of months, when word got round why I was there, uh, and that this, this, this strange Englishman was writing a book about Venetian home cooking, they started to come up to me in the street and literally you know, pulling my collar like this and saying, you have to put this recipe in your book. <laughs> And then would proceed to tell me, like like your woman down in uh, Puglia, that you do this, you do this, yeah. you do this, which was great. It's fantastic. And this this nation, which is you know uh, the greatest nation of shopkeeper, you yeah. know, it is really sad that we allowed this uh, the food industry to be taken over by the supermarket. And we we seen the death of our high streets because we don't seems to go to shops anymore and things like that. And to rekindle this sort of relation. With the with with the shopkeeper, is this one of the most important thing? Because you remember, fishmonger will know in Italy. You go if you see a fish that you don't know, you ask him what it is. You say, "I want to buy." He'll tell you how to cook it. Yeah, this is such an important thing, and it's just really down at the base. And it's really sad. And, you know, it was it was the supermarket had been allowed, and you know, the interest of the supermarket has been to put the consumer as farther away. As the as the producer, isn't it? So yeah. they're in the middle, and they can make a lot of money out of it. Yeah. So now they become much more. It's a little bit. There is a bit of a change on that. Yeah. But you know, it is. If you could spend a little bit more, it costs a little bit, just tiny little bit more money to go into a normal shop than going to a supermarket. Yeah. But you know, it makes it an such a good thing for not only for you but also for the future of the food yeah. of your kids and for the Agreed. next generation, you know, this is such an important thing. Shall we take some questions from the audience? Who has the roving mic? The, the, the um, Gareth at the back with the yellow sash. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, can I take you back to uh, invention and restriction? Um, in terms of scarcity, the Italians came up with carbonara and we came up with spam, but there must be... Um, <laughs> What, what do we do um, in, in this country? You've been living here a long time. What have you found as an influence that you began to use in your own cooking? From a, a British yeah. influence in, yeah. in Italian cooking. Well, the pie was a great uh, influence <laughs> for me. The pie was just uh, to the point that when I had a little bit of money, my aim was to go to Arrods and taste a different pie every time. And, and I really had just the right, sometimes I go there, I didn't have enough money. Oh, damn it, I had to go, come back next week to have it. But that was one of the things that was uh, amazing. And, uh, and uh, there was the famous one with the fish, 
with the tail coming out. Wasn't stargazy. It? The stargazy, uh, stargazy one, pie, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that like, left me like completely. But this idea to put all the food into uh, uh, in casing into something and then can be taken to work and be consumed in wholeness like that was was a, a great thing you know was one of the and then I don't know I, obviously you know the smoking was a, yeah. another things that uh, fascinate me a lot about obviously at the Savoy we were so proud of having this fantastic smoked salmon and so and so which in Italy smoked salmon was no was I think I think we had smoked salmon at Christmas sometimes so it was one of those things you know and this like in the region where I come from smoking is not there because it, it I obviously wasn't in that tradition there is some region on the east that, yeah. that does that but not curing was more like about so you never smoked meat you always cured it so you ham and salami and things like that so the use of salt instead the, so smoking instead than using the salt I thought the, it was something that influenced and also some dishes that I done have some bits of smoked meat or that the idea really really, really inspired me all the time yeah. another question um, do you think the tradition of family restaurants in Italy is continuing despite the fact that the younger generation perhaps are more interested in other things other than cooking? Or do you think it's... Because that's one of the things I've always felt amazing about Italy. I, I can answer um, for Venice, uh, and I can say, uh, you know, encouragingly, that in the last six or seven years, young Venetians um, have taken... Venetian cuisine back as their own. There was a long period where most of the restaurants were tourist traps, and there are there will always be the occasional news story about a restaurant, you know, charging a thousand euros for a family of four. I think it was the most recent one, but um, with fewer and fewer um, aspects of the city available to the to the young of Venice, they've they've looked at those parts of their cultural heritage that they can uh, reclaim. And food, I'm pleased to say, is one of them. So there is a new generation of uh, Venetian restaurant run by uh, young Turks, excuse the expression, but, you know, very enthusiastic um, food um, adventurers who, uh, you know, have put it, and, and who are still very traditional in, in terms of what they cook and where they go to for their ingredients and their ideas. So we're not talking about wacky... Um, great British menu, um, master chef sort of stuff. This is traditional cooking done brilliantly, but with a new energy. So I don't know whether that happens in other cities, but it's certainly something that's that's you know very evident in Venice and just in recent years as well. And also in the rest of Italy, yes, there is this tendency now to then the children takes over the restaurant of the parents. Uh, you must keep in mind that running a restaurant as a family is a uh, gargantuous <laughs> challenge. Not only you live in each other's pockets, but you, you just spend the whole day together. It's very in-looking. And, you know, when you're young, you know, all you want to do, you get to an age, and you, all you want to do is just, like, to <laughs> leave everything. And what's happening now, I notice a lot, and it's happening also in my restaurant, and I do get a lot of this young guys, then they come and they spend maybe six months, one year. They the traveling and they go out to have a look what other people do and then bring back something. This is much on the case. But they do take over a restaurant like that. And you know, also because most of the time when you're talking about a restaurant and it's a family owned restaurant, usually they own the place, they own the walls, they own the whole thing. And so if if the area still has the potential they usually take over it. No, no, it, it is it's happening. Mm. Um, I've been told we've got time for one more question. <laughs> and there's the microphone. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you. You've <laughs> told us your favorite dish. If you could only eat the food of one region of Italy for the rest of your life, what would it be? Yeah, it would still be risotto. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the risotto from Northern Italy, yeah. I mean, it's like, you see, as a chef, for me to go to, because I first, before then Puglia, I fell in love with Sicily, which is, was one of the things that, you know, I went to, I got to Sicily when I was 31. That's the first time that I went. Until then, especially when I was in Northern Italy, I only thought that, man, those guys, the mafia, they, they, they're dirty, they don't pay the tax, they, they are like the worst things, you know. And then suddenly, the first time I went there and I looked at, 
you know, I looked at this place, I realized, no, that's not, I mean, there was like uh, something wrong with what they told me. And I fell completely in love with that cuisine. And for 10 years, we've been spent at least one month of the year down there. And it was really deep into looking into what they were cooking, how they're cooking, and especially this idea of the, because the influence are very important. So in Northern Italy, we have, like, we have this great reverence for French cuisine, especially like in, because Lago Maggiore, where I was born, is what divide Piemont from Lombardy. So the Piemontese, they're almost French. They are, actually, yeah. they, are, they, are, they are as antipathic <laughs> as French, they are. So Turing is the most do beautiful. They put, do they put parsley in their <laughs> minestrone? <laughs> Turing is one of the most beautiful places in the world that you can visit, yeah. apart if it was for the Torinese, and the Torinese is like, they're like they're worse than the Parisian they are, like, you know? They did give but us Campari, though, I think, Yeah, they, they did, yeah. 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 All the type of vermouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, something, the idea is, you know, that as you, I, I guess that when you go and you immerse yourself in the territory and look at different cuisine, you would think, no, I don't want to eat anything else more. But when you are, I think that because it's tied in my memory, the food of northern Italy, that's what kind of like I prefer sort of thing, you know? Well, I think, um, I think we're being kicked out, but um, <laughs> it just remains for me to say thank you very much for coming. Thanks to yeah, Giorgio Locatelli. Thank you very much. And enjoy the, uh, enjoy the rest of the festival.